Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do you have your Bibles? Amen. First John 5, 7, 8. This sermon is entitled, You Can't Preach This Without the King James. For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. This afternoon, I want to both encourage you and discourage you. I want to encourage you to read God's holy words. I want to encourage you to trust those words. I want to encourage you to believe every word of God. I want to discourage you from using any other Bible. So I'm going to preach you a sermon that's only going to use words that were taken out or changed in the other Bibles. So if you have an NIV and you watch this, if you're on the camera or you're in this congregation, you will not be able to follow me. Ready? First of all, who are we talking about? In heaven there are three that bear record, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Let's go to Micah 5.2. We are talking about the Godhead here, but we're going to learn something more in Micah 5.2. The person I am preaching about is very important, and we need to know something about him. So let's find out from something very authoritative, the Word of God. Micah 5.2, but thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. First in 1 John 5, 7 and 8, the words in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one and the three to bear witness in the earth are missing from the other Bibles. Second, in Micah 5, 2 here, it says, His goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Goings forth is rewritten to origins. And everlasting is changed to ancient times. But His goings forth is what it's talking about. He was already doing stuff from forever. The person prophesied in this passage has been around forever and not created from forever, goings forth. The Hebrew word is very clear, and the King James is absolutely correct. We're talking about someone whose goings forth have been forever. Now please turn to Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. God has an amazing ability with his book and his words to apply them more than once. So while at one point there was a lady who was a virgin at that time who was going to have a kid, and they were going to call Emmanuel and use him for some other prophecies in the book of Isaiah, there was something else built into those words. That there would be somebody who really would be a virgin. And while still a virgin, would bear a child. But modern Bibles had Jewish translators who changed it to a young woman. But guess what? Matthew was a Hebrew, was he not? He was a tax collector. And he said very clearly that this is a film with a prophecy that the virgin, a virgin, shall be with child. So we're now talking about somebody who was born of a virgin. What does Emmanuel mean? How many people know? Raise your hand if you know what Emmanuel means. Say it with me. Ready? God with us. God with us. So whoever this is I'm about to preach about, he's born of a virgin, and his name will be God with us. Do you see how even though God gave a partial prophecy for those days, something was coming, and that name had a lot more significance because it would really be God with us. But what else will we find out? 
Let's go to 1 Timothy 3.16. I find it hilarious because the other versions completely change this verse. Because it starts out, 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed up in the world, received up into glory. Isn't it funny that the very first words are and without controversy? Because this verse is such a controversial verse. Because it wasn't a controversy when it was said. It wasn't a controversy when it happened. It was only a controversy when men changed it. And then it says, God was manifest in the flesh. The old NIV just said, He appeared in the body. Wow. <laughs> so did you. <laughs> and I think I did too. I was a little young then, but I think I believe my mother. We were all appearing in a body. And what's funny is that's not even honestly what the Greek says. It's, uh, the, the Greek that they change says os, which means who. Or quote, and, and it would be which in Latin. Which or who appeared in a body. And they don't even tell that honestly. Other translations say Christ appeared in a body. It doesn't say Christos. It doesn't say Christ. Theos. God. It's like, what's the controversy? All the controversies with them. You have the perfect word of God. The guy I'm preaching about also was God manifest in the flesh. What else do we find out about? We will come back to this verse later, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 47. First man is of the earth. Earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. All the modern translations have taken out the word Lord. From heaven, that's great. Angels have come from heaven. But he calls him so important that he simply called the second man. First man we all know is Adam. Adam. And the second man, well, we haven't given him a name yet, except for Emmanuel, which is God with us. All right? Now turn to Acts chapter 2, 29 and 30. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So what else have we learned about this man who is God, who is one with the Father and the Holy Ghost, who is God with us? He's of the flesh. According to the flesh, he's the fruit of David's loins, which means he's a descendant of King David. If you have a modern Bible, according to the flesh, you would raise up Christ is not there. What else do we learn? He's Messiah. What else do we learn? He's going to be king over Israel to sit on his throne. You get that? So if anybody tells you that Jesus doesn't have to sit on the throne in Israel, your King James Bible says otherwise, doesn't it? Right? Don't let anybody fool you, because the words are right here. There's a reason why some kind of a being or somebody decided to take out and change these words. What else can we learn about this person I'm preaching to you today? After Acts chapter 2, go to 1 John 4, 3. <clears throat> And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. 
So the Lord God Messiah came in the flesh. He's named Jesus. And anyone says it's not true, that's the spirit of Antichrist. How do I know? Because it says so here. But in your modern Bibles, that Christ is come in the flesh is missing. See, including, there was a group called Gnostics that believed that you could think and say special words, kind of like Masons, and work your way up through the archons, the spiritual beings, up into Godhood. Called apotheosis or theosis. And you could work your way up through this by having special knowledge, gnosis, where the idea that special knowledge gets you to move up the layers to Godhood. But see, they believed that you separate the man Jesus from the position Christ and from the idea of God. Even in religious science, where I was raised, they believed that a human took on the Christ self and then manifested the Godhood. And that anybody can do that. In Unity, when I went to Unity School of Christianity, which is an occultic group, they teach that in your final reincarnation you take on the Christ self. Reincarnation. They still use the Bible, but they use it for their own purposes. But see, I right hear it says, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus, the man, Christ, the Messiah and the King, according to what we just read. Raised up Christ to sit on his throne of David. Has come in the flesh. Is not of God. There you go. And that's the spirit of Antichrist. Anybody tells you anything else, that's the spirit of Antichrist. You know how I know? Because this book says so. And this is God's book. Ready for the next one? Luke chapter 1. Who is this virgin? Who is this virgin who's going to bear this son? Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So she is blessed among women. She's not above women. She's not below women. She's blessed among women. She's nothing special, except she's gotten something special given to her. All right, Matthew 125. What was given to her? And knew her not, this is Joseph from verse 24, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's go back to 24 and read both of them again because most of you are there now. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. We now know the wife is Mary, and she's a virgin. And knew her not, which means they did not have marital relations. They can't make a baby if he doesn't know her. She was a virgin. Knew her not till up to the point of, did God intend him to be a celibate? No. Knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Amen. Okay, that is Jesus whom we're preaching. Amen. Her firstborn is taken out in other Bibles. But it is her firstborn son. Because after that came James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, James being the James at the end of the book, and Judas being Jude at the end of the book, and sisters, so we don't even know all their names. It's a bunch of kids. It's a nice size family. God blessed them. God said that He blesses people with kids. So after he is newer, she could have other kids. But until then, she stayed a virgin. The doctrine's very clear. I haven't had to go to any other scriptures. But if you don't have a King James Bible, you can't preach this sermon. Mark chapter 1, please. Mm -hmm. Mark 1, 1. Very, very simple verse. No controversy at all. Simple few words. The beginning of the gospel 
of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Except for one thing. Sinaiticus is missing Son of God. Not all the Bibles are missing Son of God, because they know very well that if you take the words the Son of God out of verse 1, then according to the rest of the chapter, he had to confess his sins and get baptized, and then God adopted him as his son in verse 11. That's called adoptionism. People who read the Sinaiticus, the Greek Codex Sinaiticus, and believe it, believe that Jesus was not God. And believing that Matthew, not Matthew, but Mark was the first gospel, and Matthew was not the first gospel, even though their hero Origen even said it was the first gospel, they say Mark is the first gospel, then Mark doesn't have Jesus as the Son of God. But I've already given you other verses that they've taken out that show you he was eternally the Son of God. His goings forth have been from everlasting. Amen? Amen. That's the Jesus I'm talking about. He's the Son of God. So he's not just God. He's the Son of God. So he's not all of the God there is. He's the Son of God. He's not. And what does he call his... What does he call God when he prays to him? He calls him his father. Son, father. That kind of works. All right. That's what we have for Mark 1, verse 1. Now turn to Philippians chapter 2. Let's start at verse 6. We want to learn some more about this person called Jesus who's now born of a virgin inside a lady named Mary with a husband who is not really the father. He's the husband of Mary, but not the father of Jesus. Are you with me so far? Amen. Verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What's changed here? The translation. The translation has changed in the other Bibles. Instead of saying, who being in the form of God, they have all sorts of other things they said, but the form is important. He was in the form of God, and then he did something. The NIV says, he made himself nothing. Really, is this Puss in Boots where the, guy, the giant turns himself into a little mouse and the cat bounces on him? No. He made himself nothing? New American Standard, he emptied himself? Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> Empty glass. No. Because then he'd be only a human. If he's only a human, you're stuck. We're all in our sins. Because an ordinary human can't pay for anybody else's sins, much less his own. And even if he were perfect, he'd only pay for his own. It wouldn't, and he couldn't be perfect. Because if he were only a human, he'd be descended from Adam and he'd have Adam's curse. But he's not. He's placed inside a woman named Mary. He was placed there. The father lovingly placed his son inside Mary. most interesting conception in the world because it was God coming into his own creation, the author going inside his own book. He made him, he was in the form of God and it says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's way better than what you see in the other Bibles because they retranslated those words to say he thought equality with God wasn't a thing to be grasped. Now there's two kinds of grasp. There's grasping on like this, trying to get it, grasping at it, or, to be grasped this way. For years I read the New American Standard and thought it meant that you couldn't understand it. No, that's not what it says at all. Our pots are crap. No, steal. Steal away. Grab away. It wasn't robbery. He did not rob his position. And to show that he didn't rob his position, he took on the form. Now watch all the form words. Look, look down your text. Being in the form of God, thought not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of man, found in fashion as a man. You get the idea? He's God plus. He's not God minus. 
There are modern preachers who will tell you that Jesus was an ordinary man who had to be born again himself. And he wasn't born again until after three days and three nights of being tortured by devils in hell for his sins. Because he wasn't born again yet. And after he was born again, then he came up with his godhood kind of thing going, and then he's able to help everybody else, and then you too can become gods. If you listen very carefully to these sermons, as I have, and read or read their sermons, you'll see what they're really saying. Man, no, I came out of that cult. I'm not doing that again. I believe the book. Amen. So I believe in the one who made himself of no reputation, not made himself nothing. In fact, no reputation. He didn't go into a palace, did he? He went into a cave or a stable or something, whatever you want to call it, whatever they're feeding the animals in, wherever. I haven't been to Bethlehem lately, and I don't know where it was. And I, last time I checked, I don't have a time machine. But whatever it was, he was born in that a place where you feed animals. That's a person who made himself of no reputation. He didn't give any invitation to Herod. Herod, come on over and see this. No. No, God went to some people in another country and invited them, and they told the king. Right? You know the story because you've read it. He made himself with no reputation. So the person I'm preaching about is in the form of God, but didn't think that was a robbery to be equal with God, which tells you that he's equal with God. If anybody tells you that Jesus is not equal with God, that's the spirit of Antichrist. Avoid them. Avoid their teaching. That is a false gospel. That is another Christ. So if you find out your Bible is translated by somebody who believed that Jesus wasn't equal with God the Father, wasn't eternally God the Son, and didn't take on the form of a man without emptying out his godhood, then I would stay away from that Bible. If you find out your Bible's got that, stay away from that Bible, which is basically all of them. Okay. <laughs> then on this one, the King James Bible. You cannot preach this sermon without a King James Bible. Now go back to Luke, please. Let's look about this kid after he's born. Luke chapter 2, verse 43. Luke chapter 2, verse 43, And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Who didn't know of it? Joseph and his mother. What's his mother's name, everybody? Mary. Mary. Is Joseph his father? No. That comes in really important a few verses from there. Joseph is not his father. Parent? Not really. He's the guy who married Mary. Watch this, please. Now, Joseph and his mother is translated his parents. Is actually the text has changed. They changed the words to his parents in the other Bibles. They're not his parents. Mary's his mother, because he physically came out of her. Of the seed of David, because she was of the seed of David through Nathan, according to Luke. But Joseph is not his father. Please watch what happens when Mary talks to him after they find their son that has been three days not with them. They had to work their way back the caravan, all the way back to Jerusalem. Finally, they think, do you think that he might be in the temple? And there he was. They went there up the stairway to the upper side. They walked to where the Pharisees and the Sadducees had their little court thing there. And there's this little kid, 12 years old. Let's go right there, verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. Why? Let's go back to verse 46. And it came to pass that the three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Remember, he's hearing them and asking them questions, but what are the doctors amazed about? Verse 47, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. There's a little 12-year-old kid who just happened to have created them. 
<laughs> he knows what they had for dinner last night. He knows how many chromosomes are in their body. He knows every DNA. He knows the thoughts they're thinking while he's answering their questions. He knows that when he asks a question, that they needed to hear that question asked. He knows what will push their buttons. He's God. Amen. So Mary, in verse 48, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother, because she's his mother, he came out of her. She was a virgin named Mary, and he came out of her. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Eh, wrong answer. And Jesus is about to correct his mother. The Creator is about to correct the creation as a 12 year old child. <laughs> Verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that he sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Amen. Using the word business means that Jesus was about his father's business. The other translations pick a different word that make him no longer about his father's business. You can look it up for yourself and see what different options they have. But he was about his father's business. It makes absolute sense. One, it translates the whole context correctly. And secondly, it's in the book. This is the book that produces faith. The other ones produce doubt. If I had nothing to look at but fruit, I'd know this is the right book. Every, almost every Bible college, almost every seminary, almost every theologian, almost every atheist, almost every pagan, almost every heathen of other kinds, almost every religion, um, almost every book, almost every course, almost every degree is against this book. A book is more known by its enemies than by its cover. When the NIV put Holy Bible on the front, even with people who weren't King James people back in the 80s, they looked at that and said, that's blasphemy. You can't call that a Holy Bible. We know that. Even they knew the NIV wasn't the Holy Bible. They thought that was blasphemy that they even put that on the front. But you don't know a book by its cover, you know it by its enemies. This book's hated. That should tell you something. I want to know about this book, if for nothing else than that. And I know a lot more than that. And Chris knows a lot more about that. And a lot of you, in fact, pretty much all of you know a lot more than that. And the others of you are going to be talking about the people who are here. I must be about my father's business. So whatever it is the Son is doing, the Son of God who's come in the world, through a virgin named Mary, who is God, who created everything, who is equal with God, which is a term for the Father, which we see in reading the New Testament. This Jesus is about his Father's business. What is his Father's business? Is he a carpenter? No, because it's not about Joseph. It's about somebody else, right? So it's something important. Let's find out. Turn back, or turn over to chapter 4. In chapter 4, Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. Let's start at verse 1, please. Just the next page or two. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Yeah, forty days. Don't try this at home. It really is true. Don't, don't. <laughs> no. Verse 3, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, Ooh, what a jerk. If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. You're hungry, right? And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone. Read the rest with me but by every word of God. You know what's really ironically true about this verse? The words, but by every word of God, are missing in the other Bibles. The very part that tells you you live by every word of God has parts of every word of God taken out. 
Even if you read it in the Old Testament, you'd know that that's what it says. <sighs> he's about his father's business. And whatever he's about is concerned with every word of God. And was it you, Chris, that said it's every, it's man. It's not just this group. It's not just the Israelis. Man, that's male and female. He called them men. He called them after the day they were created. Male and female, everybody, mankind. Sometimes not so kind. <laughs> Cannot live by bread alone. What we're gonna live by is every word of God. I want a book with every word of God, don't you? Luke chapter 4, 4, that's where we were. Now let's go to John 9. Let's find out some more about the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The descendant of David, born of a virgin named Mary, whose husband was Joseph, who was not the father. Because the Father in heaven is the Father. Luke chapter 9. There's a man that was born blind. Verse 35, he's already been cast out. The man born blind, who's now been healed and now can see. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He did not say in response, Son of God, I believe in God, but I don't believe anything about a son. He just got healed by a guy. He knows his name is Jesus because he heard him, and then he got healed of him, and suddenly he saw him. He's hear, heard teachings coming around. He says, Dost thou believe in the Son of God? Who is he that I might... Who is he? Oh, I'm sorry. I've got to read that. Verse 36, he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? He's learned something really fast. Because he had already said, verses before, verse 33, he said, If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they said, You're lecturing us? Get out of here! Kind of. My paraphrase. But basically, if he were not a God, he could do nothing. So he said, you believe in the Son of God. Who is it? I might believe on him. Listen, you heal me. I'm, I'm there. What, what are you telling me to do right now? I'm here. I am all ears. I'm attentive. Who is he that I might believe on him? Do you believe on a man? How many of you think you should believe on an ordinary man? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, I'm not seeing those hands. Good. Verse 37, And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. In other words, he said, here I am, right standing in front of me. Read the next verse very carefully. I'm going to tell you something you don't know. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Do you worship man? Yes or no? I want to hear it loud. Do you worship man? No. Thank you. We don't worship man. Did you know that all the other Bibles following Sinaiticus and Vaticanus say, Dost thou believe on the Son of Man? Go to Ezekiel. Son of Man just means man. Jesus is the one who started adding meaning to Son of Man, but people didn't know that. They didn't catch on until after. He was the one like the Son of Man from Daniel chapter 7, but they didn't know that yet. So if you say, Dost thou believe in the Son of Man, it means nothing. And he wouldn't say, Why would I believe? He'd say, Why would I believe on it? Right? But dost thou believe in the Son of God? Who is he that I might believe on him? Because you don't believe on humans, you only believe on God. So this guy's already pretty in the advanced school right now. He's in the advanced school of eyes open, no longer blind school. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Do you worship man? No. You only worship who? God. Did you know in the Sinaiticus, I found this when I was doing another video, I was doing some work on it, that it is missing, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. That's actually not in the Sinaiticus. It's written in the margin by somebody else later, which I'll tell about in another video sometime. But that's what it said. It's actually missing. No Bible will take it out. You know why? Because they're smarter than that. They know that you have to have it, or the passage makes no more sense. But their favorite Bible, next to favorite, Sinaiticus, doesn't have it. So they're willing to take out 
Son of God and change it to Son of Man. But they were not willing to take out that verse by them worshiping. But we believe it because it's in the book. God's book. You can't preach this sermon without a King David. And he worshiped him. So he is the Son of God, and he is worthy of worship. That's what the Jesus I'm preaching right now. What else can we learn about him? Go to Matthew chapter 9. He was about his father's business. What is his father's business? We already know he's healed people, so we know he's able to. And he is worthy of worship. Whoever this man is, who is God, who is the Son of God, who is born of a virgin, who is eternal, but took on flesh, is worthy of worship. Matthew 9, please start at verse 10. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that behold, me not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what this meaneth, I will have, that meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners, last two words would be, to repentance. If anybody tells me repentance isn't part of the gospel, Jesus said, I came to call, not the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. Modern Bibles take out the words to repentance. What is repentance? Turn and face the Lord. When you repent, you turn to face the Lord. You were facing your sins, or your sins, or your sins, or any other God, or any other thing, or your own mirror reflection, whatever it was, but you weren't facing Jesus Christ, because it says you were supposed to, as you read it on the scriptures, repent and believe. It doesn't say believe and repent. So it doesn't mean list off your sins before the Lord, because you don't know your sins. You're too busy being in sin. You were awash in sin. You can't list off your sins in front of a holy God. You think he'd say, Okay, that's five out of four thousand. <laughs> For the first list, that'll cover Thursday. Yeah, then you can't list your sins. That's not what repentance is. It's that you change to turn to face Him. That's why He said that the Son of Man be lifted up. Like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. They had to turn and look. They've been bitten. They're going to die. They had to turn and look at the serpent on the pole. And then God healed him. Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's what God said. So repent happens before you believe. Before you can place your faith in somebody, you've got to at least be looking at him. And when he's the God of the universe, he wants your attention. The Jesus I'm preaching about is one you have to turn to look at. So he said he's come to call sinners to repentance. That means, I don't care what you're looking at. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. That's repentance. Anybody says anything else, they're selling something. <laughs> All right. Now we got, that's Matthew chapter 9. Now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. Came to call people to repentance, but what else do we learn? In verse 11. Matthew 18, 11. For the Son of Man is come. Aha! Purpose clause. We're going to find what his purpose is. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Amen. That's missing. In the other Bibles, we'll find that verse. You cannot preach this sermon without a King James. The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Want to know his purpose? You're reading it right now. Repent and be saved somehow. 
Now, how is that going to happen? Well, we have to find out something. Go to Luke chapter 9. Because the power is in the words. Amen. You don't have the words, you don't have the power. We'll get to more in a second. Verse 51, please. And it came to pass when the time was come that he, Jesus, should be received up. Boy, there's a lot of times it's going to tell you. You're going to see different verses that quietly tell you about received up. We already read one of them about received up into heaven. Great is the mystery of godless, godliness. But right here it says received up. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. Set his face to go to Jerusalem. Remember everybody, anybody ever study anything about the Samaritans and where they're located? If you're in Galilee, you're up here. Samaria's in the middle, and Judah is down here. But the Jews don't have any dealings with the Samaritans, so instead of going like that, they go all the way over here, they cross the Jordan, they go down over here to a crossing, come over a bridge over here, and then they go down and across into Judea, and all that. Jesus set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. Amen. So he's going to go to Jerusalem. If God wants to go to Jerusalem, he's going to Jerusalem. He made it. He made Samaria too. He knew everybody there. Do you realize the people who judged him, he knew every one of them? He could tell you how many hairs were on their head. Dude. What would you do with that power? Die. Um, no, that's not going to work. Yeah, so he said his face to go through, and that means he's going to go right through Samaria to Jerusalem. Look at the next verse, 52. And set messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. That's what his disciples do. They go, they go ahead, set things up, and Jesus keeps on going. Verse 53, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Well, they were paying attention, but they would not receive him. 54, and when the disciples, James, his disciples, James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? <laughs> you powerful, we know you can do this. Verse 55. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. If you have another Bible, the words even as Elias did to get you to understand why the fire coming down from heaven is. Oh yeah, I remember. If I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume you in your 50, crispy cream, or crispy crunch right there, you know, and the next group comes up and goes, oh dude. <laughs> <sighs> Elijah, the, the king wants you to <sighs> crispy crunchies. Third group comes. Get the idea? <laughs> you know, I I I I fear God. Hey. Elijah, look, um, Krispies, uh, can, can I not be a crispy? Would you? I don't want to. If you want to come see the king, it's okay with me, but you know, I really do fear God. <laughs> I'll come with you. No, no, really. I'm, I'm not, no, not going to turn around and you're going to go, and I'm going to be crispy like them. No, I'm just, I'm just saying, please. No, I'm going to come with you. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Even as Elias did. Brings up the whole story. That's missing. If you don't have a King James Bible. And then after that, when Jesus gives them, it just says he turned and rebuked them and they went to another village. What? Then what's the point? Why tell the story? He turned and rebuked them and they went to another village. It means nothing. There's no lesson. That's what I have in my book, Look What's Missing. I show that there's missing lessons here. But there's a reason. Because the Gnostics don't want to have a purpose like this. They want the purpose to be to have the secret knowledge and ascend through the archons up into the demiurge. You want to work your way up to Godhood. So Jesus responds in the opposite way. 
Ye know not what manner of spirit you are, ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. He came to save lives, not to destroy them. His first coming is not about destruction. It's about salvation. Awesome. Why did they take it out? I just told you. But it's missing. But it's in this book. I believe this book. This is the book that produces faith. People that have the books that produce doubt, look at them online. Look at the look at the surveys. Look at the Barna surveys. Look at the Lifeway surveys. Look at any of them. Go to the churches, find out the statements of faith. You'll find that they don't believe. They don't believe that Jesus is eternal. They don't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. They believe that Jesus sinned. Because they believe their book. Their book takes out these words. These words produce faith. If these words are taken out, or stuck in the footnotes, or stuck into the margin, <coughs> they produce doubt. This is called the Christian faith, not the Christian doubt. You don't say doubt cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of the ESV. You say faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So this is obviously not an ESV. All right. You knew that. So we're at Luke chapter 9. Now, let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. This is so awesome. This is what Christ came to do. And it is a crime to take it out of a Bible. Colossians 1.14, please. Can I read from verse 13, please? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his what? Blood. Blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. The entire Old Testament is about what? You gotta have a sacrifice for sins. The entire sacrificial system says you need what to have a sacrifice? You gotta have blood to have a sacrifice for sin. And he shed his. And modern Bibles remove Colossians 1, 14 words through his blood. It doesn't even make logical sense, but they don't care, because they're not looking for a book that's logical. In fact, textual criticism is based around the idea that the harder reading is the better one. You prefer the harder reading. So if it contradicts, makes no sense, it's hard to understand how it got there, then it must be the true one. I believe we have a God who's consistent, Amen. who's clear, and whose purpose can be easily discerned. And that's what my Bible says. Through His blood. So this Jesus that I'm preaching about shed his blood. If you have a Bible that takes out the blood, it's the wrong book. Amen. It's hard to call it a Bible. Now, go to Hebrews, please. See, I believe the book, and I know what the letter's for. The letter's for the person it's given to. If it's not for the person it's given to, it's like, it's, it's deception. I'm not going to deceive somebody. I'm going to give them a letter for them. They're going to read it, and they'll take it in themselves. Now, if it talks about somebody else, then it's talking about somebody else. And if it's talking to you, it's talking to you. And if it's talking to the unbelievers in the congregation, like it was here, then it's for the unbelievers. If it's talking to the believers in that same congregation, it's talking to them. What was happening at the time Hebrews was written? Does anybody know? Persecution was about to come in, and there was a shift in Roman law. The legal religion was Judaism. It was made illegal even though they didn't have any gods. Even though they didn't do the pinch of incense to Caesar, even though they didn't do the oblations and sacrifices and all the different things that you do for government jobs in, in the Roman Empire, it was made illegal, or this religio licta, or legal religion. Christianity, they figured out, dude, the Jews don't like you. Um, you're different. You're not legal. Now, at that time, there are Jews that are visiting and hearing about that this is the Messiah Jesus, and they're thinking about coming to over to Him and placing their faith in Him. But at the same time, the laws are changing. 
And this is going to get bad. They could get hurt. And remember, if you're unsaved, you're not willing to die for something you're not sure about. Right? It's the Christians who have faith who made it through the trials. So the Jews in those congregations are having some serious trouble. So Paul is writing to both in the same letter. You can tell who they are by seeing what he's telling them. They couldn't enter in because of what? Unbelief. Then it's somebody who's not believing he's writing to. Other people he's talking about continuing in the faith. Well, then that's who he's writing to there. When you've got a mixed congregation, you've got to talk to both of them, right? The saved and the unsaved. Yes, but it's about works. No, it's not. It's about faith. You've got to pay attention to the words. If I think it's something about works and God says it's about faith, then who's wrong? Me. Not the book. I don't change the book. I don't wrongly divide the Word of God by throwing it off and saying that doesn't matter for 2,000 years. I'm just being honest with you. I can't be anything else. I, I, I have somebody to report to, and I'm scared. I don't want him to be mad at me. I want to say what he wants me to say. So please go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 3. <coughs> Who, meaning Jesus, being the brightness of his, that's the Father's, glory, and the express image of his, the Father's, person, and upholding all things by the word of his, that's the Son's, power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, that's his Father, right? And all the other Bibles by himself is removed. But see, I don't need Mary, I don't need Joseph, I don't need the angels, I don't need the saints, I don't need Gene Scott, right again, I don't need anybody, I need Jesus. Amen. Jesus by himself purged our sins. Amen. By the shedding of blood, absolutely. First Peter 4, 1, please. It's about the blood. It's all about the blood. If you don't have the shedding of blood, Jesus could have purged our sins. Why? He made the system. He gave the law to Moses. It was the Son, not the Father. No man had seen the Father, God, at any time. The only begotten Son. He had the clay. Right? 1 Peter 4.1 for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Who did he suffer for? Us. Isn't that awesome? He suffered. All that suffering he went through was for us. Praise the Lord. For us is missing in the other Bibles. If you don't have a King James Bible, you cannot preach this sermon. <laughs> Let's go back to 1 Timothy 3.16 for a second. I told you we'd come back to it. We're almost there. Let's read the whole thing again. And without controversy, great is the ministry of God when this God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. After he purged our sins, he did what? He was received up into glory. And that's just like what we did read already in Philippians. When we were in Philippians, it said, And being found in fashion as many humbled themselves, became obedient unto death, and the death of the cross, verse 9, wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a great verse, but if you don't have all these other verses, you don't have the build-up. You just have a great story, but you don't have the who, the what, the when, the where, the why. I just gave all that to you, the verses that are missing from the other Bibles. Now go to Mark 16. Let's finish the story. Mark chapter 16. Oh no, Mark chapter 16. Out of all the Greek manuscripts in the world, 
and all the codices, until it may have made up some a few years ago, only two are missing verses 9 to 20. Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. That's not suspicious at all. <laughs> every translation, every ancient translation has it. Minuscule, majuscules, all those schools. Mark 16, starting at verse 9. What happened to Jesus? Now when Jesus was risen, aha! He was risen. I love it. Early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. And she went and told them that it had been with him, and they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive, and had seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form, under two of them as they walked and went into the country. They went and told her to the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward, it appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he had said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Let me stop right there. See, if you don't believe and you get baptized, you have a wet sinner. If you believe and are baptized, you have an obedient Christian. Right? No controversy here? It was really simple. That was so difficult, wasn't it? And these signs shall follow them that believe. Yes, I'm going to read those forbidden verses that Ryrie said, you shouldn't base any doctrine on these words. Because they don't really look. We don't. Mm. And all these different Bibles, they've got a bunch of study Bibles, say, no, it's not wise to base a doctrine on any of these words. <laughs> Funny, because people with an awful lot of faith have lasted over 400 years, and generation after generation after generation after generation. All they had to do was believe these words, and God took care of them just fine. Yes. Funny, they just called it the book. They believed it. My ancestor, Roger Williams, founded the First Baptist Church in the United States. Before it was the United States, my ancestors came off the Mayflower, the Hopkins line. They had a King James Bible. No, they didn't have a Geneva. That's funny, because the only one that's documented to have been on the Mayflower is a King James Bible. Go to Pilgrim Hall, Massachusetts. It's a photograph, and you can see it right there in the case. The other ones, maybe. But they bought it just before they left. We can tell because it tells you the date, which is really nice. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Did you see me casting out of devils in the book of Acts? Yeah, I'd say you did. They shall speak with new tongues. Did anybody speak with new tongues? As a matter of fact, a very short time after this, his own disciples did themselves, and some other people did too. And people heard the gospel in their own language. They shall take up serpents. Oh, I seem to remember a guy named Paul on the island of Malta. And he picked up a serpent. It kind of fastened itself to him, but he picked it up. <laughs> Look what I picked up. And they went, aha, the gods don't like him. And they wouldn't let him... He survived the water, so they won't let him survive this thing. He shakes the thing off him with the fire. They're going, okay, he's going to puff up and die, and nothing. And they went, he's a god. <laughs> Talk about fickle. They're like, you know, <laughs> my goodness, you made a YouTube video about that. And after that, no, 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 no. He gets him to Jesus and converts people on the island. It's awesome. Okay, so check, check, check. Okay, we've checked it off. Next one. They shall take up servants, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Didn't hear anything about that, but if Jesus said it, it must be true. I do know some missionaries in Mexico, and they were living there, and they were trying to preach the gospel. And at one point, people started looking at them funny. And funnier. And funnier. And then people started getting saved. It's like, so what made the difference for you guys? They said, well, you didn't die. What do you mean? We've been poisoning you for months. <laughs> God wanted the gospel to be open to that group in Mexico. And he didn't give a rip of what chemicals were in there. 
Did he? Because the gospel is more important. So I was going, yeah, I'm suspending those laws right now. <laughs> and so those missionaries never even knew about it until they were told by the converts that they were poisoned. They drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Did anybody lay their hands on the sick in the book of Acts? Yes, they did. Now get ready. Ooh, controversy. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven. There we go again. Received up into heaven. Keep hearing that. And sat on the right hand of God. So now we know he's got a throne up there. And they went forth, past tense. And preached everywhere, past tense. The Lord working with them. Okay, that's part of what? A past tense. When you have an ing word, it's subject to whatever you just listed. What's your main verb? Preached. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Did it happen? Yes! What's the controversy? Oh, amen. There. Now, <laughs> what's the controversy? There's no controversy. Unwise to base the doctrine. You just don't want to believe it because you like Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. That's what's going on, Mr. Scholar, you. You want to feel like you know more than other people, and you say, yes, but I'm not going to take it out of the Bible because you won't buy it. Well, I'm not buying your argument. It's in the book. And people who believe the book have faith following. Amen. I believe every word of this. He was ascended into heaven. Two more verses. John 6, 47, please. This is the Jesus I'm preaching. How many people saw, what was it called, the Prince of Egypt, that cartoon about Moses? Many years ago, yeah, they were, if you believe. <laughs> <laughs> they made it with Muslims, did you know that? Muslims were part of the making of the movie, they, they modified it so it didn't upset any Muslims. <coughs> did you know that? <coughs> believe what? If you believe what? Only believe, believe what? Look at some people's backs of their pickups. I believe I'll have another beer. That's not what I believe. You have to have a, an object. Where are you going to believe? Or who are you going to believe? I remember in religious science church as a teenager hearing this verse, missing these words. Let me read them to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The Jesus I preach is someone you need to believe on. Nobody else. Nobody else did the work. Nobody else shed his blood. Nobody else was perfect. Nobody else was eternal. Nobody else was equal with God. Nobody else was the Son of God. Nobody else was powerful enough. Nobody else knew their thoughts. Nobody else was able to do any of this. But Jesus. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. You will find time after time in the other Bibles they are moving to the Lord or Jesus or Christ. At least one of them. Why? Because the power is in the Word of God. Amen. And if He's the Lord and Jesus and Christ, He's God, become a man who is the King, the rightful King of Israel. And guess what that also means? You can't just say that Jesus is responsible for all bad things in the world. No, 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 no. God's going to plan with Israel because Jesus has got to reign on the throne. <coughs> if Jesus is going to reign on the throne, there's got to be an Israel. There's got to be Jerusalem, and there's got to be a temple. Boy, that changes your theology quick. It changes your eschatology, your end times, really fast. All because you have all the words there. Take out some of the words, your doctrine changes. And that's what happened. As I tell people repeatedly, I'm not standing at the beginning of history saying, if you have a change in your Bible, this is what's going to happen, or may happen, or might happen, or could happen. I'm standing at the end of history saying, dudes, this is what happened. This is how we got in the mess we are. This is how we got here. It's already been done. This isn't a doing deal. This is a done deal. That's what the proliferation of non-this are doing and have done. 
for generations. What Chris and I are doing is trying to expose the wool that's been pulled over our eyes and the wolf that's under the sheep's clothing. The last thing, you guys got that pesky baptism. Let's go to Acts 8. Just to show you, when you believe there's something you should do, when you believe, after you're saved, there's something you should do. Am I taking too long? Is it okay? You guys all right? All right. In the verse, let's start at verse 26 then. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, and the way that goes south from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, covered at the gate was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Esaias the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, realize an angel goes and does one thing, then a spirit talks to him, and he knew which one was which. What a relationship with God, to know him one from the other. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join myself on the this chariot. Out of the caravan, all he knows is he's being obedient. He's walking out in the middle of a desert, then suddenly there's a guy. Whew, okay. Join yourself to that chariot. The super <laughs> powerful guy is sitting there and he's reading. You're gonna go bug him. How many of you would do it? Good thing he knew it was the spirit. And Philip ran thither. He ran because he was obedient. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he'd come up and sit with him. No, no, you're a Gentile. We can't be, we're Jews. We don't stay around you Ethiopians. Nope. He climbed right up. Because his soul was more important than his race. And besides, race is a new term. More important than his color, background, whatever you want to call it. Outside of the place in the scripture which he went was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, dumb for his shearer, so opened he not his mouth, and his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? You know, Isaiah 52 13 to 53 12 is what he was reading. The very prophecy of the Messiah coming. Verse 34 And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? I know of a Jewish guy who became, who was studying in rabbinical school, becoming a rabbi, and he got to where he had the question about Isaiah. And he asked about this passage. And the other rabbis there said, You asked too many questions. That's what they told him. In his discouragement, he walked into the middle of the town, hoped nobody watched him, and went into that forbidden store, called the Bible Bookstore. And he got the forbidden book, King James Bible. And he read it, and he found out the answer, got saved. But he was still going to rabbinical school. And they found out, and he got his answers, and he got saved. He paid his money, so they let him finish his courses. But when everybody else was going through the procession, and one would go, you know, Rabbi Shimon. You know, Rabbi Shimuel. Rabbi Joseph. That's what happened. But he did it. Scared to death. Because now he has to go talk to his mom in California. He went to talk to his mom in California. He's scared to death. Is my mom going to disown me? He arrives. <sighs> mom, I've become a Christian. Praise God! So did I! <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. That's the Jesus I'm preaching. 
And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. Okay, what God hinder me to be baptized? Because the Jews always had rules. You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. What's the rule, guys? Verse 37, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What happened next? Verse 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they were coming out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord, whoop, that sound in the chest, caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at his Otis, about 14 miles away. And passing through, the, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. See, once he got baptized, he was now an obedient believer. Mark 16, proper application. Most Bibles don't have that verse. If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that that's the Jesus that I preach. And that's the Jesus of this book. And if you believe on the Jesus that I've just preached out of this book, and these verses you can't find in other Bibles, you will be saved. And if you can say from your heart that you have given yourself in faith to the Son of God, realizing you're a sinner, confessing it before Him, repenting, if you turn toward Him and you express your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved and you are now qualified to be baptized. No 12-week course. If you, I don't know if you have one, but if you do, it's not scriptural. No 12-week course. You can go dunk them right then and then. Right then and there. Bam! Bam! Same hour of the night, Acts 16. Jailer got baptized, not just him, but his whole family. Oh, so he believed for his family. No, they preached all the family. Look very carefully at the verse. If you read it out of the King James Bible, you know what it says. If you read the other ones, you don't. Because they change those words. Why? Something happened in somebody's heart, and they decided that they were going to trust scholars instead of God. That was your plan, God. Babes, ordinary folk, us, not scholars. If you have not given yourself to this Jesus in faith, and you want to, this is your time. Yeah. I'm simply going to pray right now, and then I'm going to step down. And then you, if you want to get saved and you're not saved, then there's somebody here or who can lead you. But that's the Jesus I preach. That is the only Jesus I preach. I'm going to preach them out of this book, because this book answers all the questions I show you today. Let's pray.